Hello everyone, welcome to what if Deku was neglected and becomes the Lord of Serpents part 2. Before we start please go support lovely N1T for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. Chapter 13. Izuku didn't know what was happening. At first he was scared by Marasi, which was a reasonable reaction when held at knife point. Then he'd ask the snake with a fear quirk to slowly make it stronger, hoping that she's be too distracted to think about her quirk. But then he got stabbed. And he felt like he was burning. He couldn't even scream, frozen in place as everything started to go numb. Then he felt his skin stretching, burning, itching and breaking all while he was a spectator in his own mind. It felt like he was back in that alley two years ago when he got his quirk. Was he really that close to death back then? Before he could continue that train of thought his bones started to ache and bend, the most concerning being his legs. He opened his mouth in a silent scream when he felt his knees snap backwards and heal immediately after. Izuku's clothes ripped as his body transformed. His toes felt crushed in his boots after they melded together into three, not being able to tear their restrictions apart. He wasn't able to form any coherent thoughts about how his spine seemed to elongate, and something akin to a tail began to form as his head started to morph as well. Even as he shut his eyes, he knew that his nose and mouth stretched out to form a snout, but his teeth hurt the most as they elongated past what remained of his lips. Izuku couldn't concentrate at what was happening anymore, it was too much at once. The snakes fell off of him as he grew taller, his nails turned into claws, something was happening to his cheeks, he felt as if there was another limb attached to his back, his legs were going to give out, his head hurt so much. Before he knew it the pain was gone with a flash, but now he remembered something important. The woman was still in front of him. She saw him do whatever the hell this was. He opened his eyes to see, with an improved vision of four eyes, a terrified Marasi. She looked like she was about to run, but he couldn't let that happen that family still needed more time. The woman froze as her eyes went even wider, and she began to tremble. Izuku wanted to approach her and threaten her to stay away, not like he'd actually go through with the threat, but it'd do the trick. He started to walk, but with a mix of exhaustion, pain and his legs working completely differently than before, he fell over from where he was crouching. Marasi took that moment to faint, just as Izuku fell on top of her, he landed on his hands because he didn't know if he'd crush her with his weight. He looked around in a panic, what would he do now he was going to scare her, not make her faint. His eyes locked with ivories, just now noticing that the snakes weren't wrapped around him anymore. They all looked at him with astonished expressions, but he didn't know why they were on their snouts. Ivory cautiously slithered closer to him, keeping her head lower than she'd usually do. Almost as if she was scared of him. She spoke in his mind, which she shouldn't be able to do without Royd's help. See could you turn that off? My lord. This was the first time she'd been this nervous around him, she even started to call him her lord again, she dropped those formalities a month after she met him. He responded in a panic with a voice that was even deeper than his normal distorted one. I don't know what you're talking about, I don't even know what's happening to me, is this that second form you talked about? Wasn't it supposed to be triggered by me accepting that I have a quirk I nearly died just now? He lowered his voice again as he saw that Ivory was trembling in fear, what was this other form doing to her? And how the buck could he turn back? This couldn't be permanent, it was called a second form for a reason. He should be able to revert to his previous one if he tried hard enough. Ivory spoke through his mind again, breaking him out of his thought and back to the world of the living. You're using the F fear quirk currently, what? It took him a few seconds to process that, they all knew that he had a power source he couldn't use himself. But where the buck did this come from? He could accept that his quirk was some weird mutation from a distant relative, but wasn't this too much? He shook his head and looked back to Ivory, mental breakdown later, now he needed to revert back to being Izuku and get out of here. How do I turn it off? The two of them had some trouble, but managed to to get Izuku back into his human form and get the fear quirk to turn off. Though his human form now had the addition of even sharper nails, two sets of dark purplish brownish red horns with a long and slender tail of the same color. New problems, he was naked because his clothes were torn during the transformation, his new appendages would be very hard to hide, and he'd done way more damage to Marasi than he intended. It went from threatening her to possibly giving her PTSD. So a bit overkill. The last problem was easier to solve, he just found Marasi's room and took some of her smaller clothes. They were still incredibly oversized, but better than being naked. He walked back downstairs to her unconscious body. Thinking about what to do, he eventually settled on dragging her to an alleyway and putting an alcohol bottle in her hand. If people saw her they'd think she was just some passed out drunk and let the heroes who probably couldn't care less handle it. Scouting out which alley was empty with the help of the shadow manipulation snake, he accidentally found a man taking drugs. Why he was doing that in an alley of all places was none of Izuku's business. He was planning to leave the man be, but Ivory stopped him by saying, I know that stuff, smelled it before. It's the type that gives you vivid hallucinations, don't know why you humans keep taking such things. That brought him to an idea. After waiting for a while, the man fell to the ground giggling to himself. 
A few minutes after, he was out cold. Izuku climbed down from the building he was on and went up to the man. Searching his body, Izuku thanked his normally shitty luck as he found another dose on the man. There came a quiet O oh from Ivory as she realized what his plan was. He just saw how the man took the drug, so he had a pretty good idea how to administer it. The police wouldn't believe her if she still had a hallucinogenic drug in her after all. And if he did something wrong. At least she was a shitty person. Grabbing the empty and full syringes from the unconscious man, using the oversized sleeve as a glove because he wasn't going to touch something like that with his bare hands, he jogged back to the house. It took a lot of effort and time to drag Marasi's unconscious body up the stairs, but he managed to plop her down on her bed. He took the empty syringe and placed it in the bathroom drawer, that's probably where a drug addict would put it, then he took the full syringe and crawled on top of her. Taking her wrist he slowly inserted the syringe, then emptied the syringe the best he could with his shaking hands. Of course he was nervous, he just drugged someone, taking the syringe out, he put it in her open hand and used a paper towel to wipe a bit of vomit off her face before he went downstairs and cleaned all the stuff in the kitchen. And looking at the knives, his blood was a translucent purple now. When he put everything back in place, excluding the gloves that he'd take with him and dispose elsewhere, and left. He'd have to hire someone to edit the street cameras in the nest, he didn't nearly use enough shadows to cloak himself in hindsight. Izuku sighed as he climbed through his bedroom window and changed into his pajamas, texting the family that the job was done and receiving his payment. Next time he should be more prepared, the fact that that man was there was a coincidence, and if he hadn't been there he'd be screwed. He let out a wry laugh. Next time. He'd never be able to sit still won't he? Grabbing his phone he opened the serpent's nest and looked at people who were in his price range as the snakes cuddled up to him. Next time he'd make his plan flawless. Chapter 14. The next two years were an emotional rollercoaster for Izuku. In the end, he couldn't figure out what exactly his second form meant. His quirk was called Conjured, but that didn't really suit anymore. He'd have to think of a better name when he managed to figure out more. But the day after, the whole of Serpent's Nest was going crazy. Everyone thought that Jormungand would send a henchman out to do the job he'd agreed to, not show up in the flesh. This was important information because the leader wasn't just some guy behind a computer, but someone who could fight. It didn't really help that somehow it had gotten out that the police didn't believe Marasi because she was under the influence of drugs, well the husband made it clear to anyone who asked that she wasn't a junkie. That made people question just what his quirk was. The only thing they were 100% sure of was that it was powerful. So this prompted multiple people to seek out Jormungandra if the situation got dire. There were also people who wanted him to join their gang or help them do robberies and such, but we don't talk about them. Or how they were caught by the police because of an anonymous tip-off. But for the people who genuinely needed help, he looked if there was anyone who was able to. Showing himself was an absolute last resort. He only showed himself twice after the first time. Those were, of course, only after he had learned some basic fighting techniques. He couldn't improve all that much, considering that he didn't have anyone to spar with, but it was a good start. The only option he could think of was vigilantism, but that was downright stupid. If he did that, the police and pro heroes would be after him, and he was in no way, shape or form, confident that he could escape them. Though that didn't mean that he didn't experiment with his second form. The first thing he did after learning to walk was focusing on using the snake's quirks. What he'd figured out was that he could use multiple of their quirks at once, but that took more energy. Another thing was that if he used a quirk, the snake which it belonged to could still use it, but it was weakened. When he was in his second form and wasn't using their quirks, the snakes would be able to use them at triple the normal power. And all those numbers went up with practice. So he went ahead and called it his assault mode, seemed pretty accurate. It would be easier for him if his second form wasn't already recognized as Jormungandr, then he'd be able to use his normal form as that and sign up for self-defense classes. He already had way too much of an allowance, and it wasn't like his family would notice him coming home later. But alas, it was far too late for that. There wasn't any time for pondering about all of this anyway, he needed to get to school. One of his snakes warned him as he was getting dressed that today would be very bad. He had a very ambiguous sensing quirk that kinda worked like future sight, but only gave him weird feeling that he couldn't really put his finger on. So the fact that he could tell that today wasn't going to be good set Izuku on edge. Helping Ivory, Shro and a light yellow snake called Dandelion with a quirk called Anti-Presence, which made it much easier for him to blend in, wrap around his chest along with his tail as he readied himself. It was far too early for his parents to be up, so he could quickly make his breakfast and hang around the park for an hour and a half for school. Already being in a bad mood, he decided to make himself an omelette and head to a cat cafe afterwards, there was this specific one with a quirked cat called Titan who wasn't scared of him. The other cats ran off because they probably noticed all the snakes. Before he went out he snagged a pastel purple snake with a barrier quirk, had Shro shrink her, let her wrap around his hair, and use herself as a hair tie. 
this was the sole reason he'd grown his hair out, even went to a salon so it was waist length now, and he could do more complicated hairstyles where he could fit more snakes in. Thinking about how absurd of a sentence that was, he headed out. Not knowing that this was going to be one of the worst days of his life. Chapter 15. The day had started off normal, there weren't more sneers than usual thrown his way, students tried to trip him as usual too. Nothing was out of the ordinary and that made him even more anxious. Izuku was so caught up in his own thoughts that he was startled by the teacher yelling, of course you're all aiming for the hero course. All the students started showing off their quirks at that, which brought Izuku to a conclusion. Maybe one of the quirks would misfire and the building would collapse. He was once again brought out of his thought by Katsuki screaming. Don't lump me in with these extras, teach. Katsumi followed up behind him so quick she may as well have finished his sentence. They won't even make it as some D-lister's sidekick. The entire class burst out in rage, with all sorts of insults being thrown their way. Izumi being, supposedly, the only one who could make any smart decisions, tried calming both blondes down. Come on guys they do great in any field, no matter their quirks. Izuku quietly scoffed to himself, nobody hearing him over the calming crowd of middle schoolers. The bell rang and everyone quickly made it out of the classroom. The building didn't collapse on him during class maybe after school. Even though he had packed up quickly, the trio still managed to trap him in the classroom. He genuinely debated whether or not he should jump out of one of the windows, there was a tree there, and he was confident he'd make it. But before he could come to a conclusion, Katsuki sneered at him in his usual fashion. Still think you can be a hero huh, Deku? The blonde shoved him backwards while he continued his monologue. Stay out of our way. Izumi took that as her cake to grab his math homework and float it so that Katsumi could turn it into smithereens. Standing up, Izuku dusted himself off and went to grab his bag. He'd already printed an extra copy of all his homework, so he wasn't all that worried about it. Because he had turned his back on them, he hadn't noticed that Katsuki sported a near manic grin on his face that he quickly turned back into his usual snarl. You know. Izuku turned back to him, he thought the blonde had finished speaking, but it seemed he had even more to spew. He grew uncomfortable as the same manic grin from before returned to his face. If you really want to be a hero that badly, you should take a swan dive off the roof of the building and hope for a quirk in your next life. Izumi flinched and looked at her boyfriend in horror, they wanted her little brother safe, so why did he say such a thing? Looking over to Katsumi, it seemed that she was the only one who thought this was wrong, as the blonde looked like she had just seen one of the most entertaining things in her life. But the worst would be her sweet little Izuku, he was already so fragile, who knows what he was feeling. She didn't want to turn and look at him, she knew that the blank face he wore all the time was a mask and he was hurting so much underneath. The only thing she could do was apologize and tell him after all this time that she needed to do this for his safety. Izumi turned to look at her brother, expecting to see him on the point of breaking down and sobbing after seeing his best friend say such a disgusting thing. What she got instead was Izuku looking at them all with a mixture of disappointment, anger and disgust. She was shocked, the first expression on her little brother's face in three years was this. He must have really thought they hurt him out of hatred, she needed to correct this. Walking past Katsuki with a look of we're talking about this later, she solemnly walked to her brother. Her heart stung as he put more distance between them when she tried to get closer. He was scared of her wasn't he? She could read through his facade easily, being siblings does that to you. Look I first I think I should clarify some things. Izuku looked at her in suspicion, while her friends were simply confused on what she was doing. I know that it doesn't look like it, but we're protecting you. You would only get hurt if you decided to become a hero, we couldn't let you waste your life like that so we did this. The Bakugou twins looked at the ground ashamed, they did this to stop Izuku from being a hero, but what they said was counterintuitive. Izuku was trembling at her speech, the older Yagi thought that he was incredibly moved by it and was trying to contain his emotions. I know that what Katsuki said wasn't right, what we've been doing isn't exactly good either. But I know you understand there was simply no other way to let you see that being a hero isn't an option. She had tears in her eyes by the end of her improvised speech, but was glad that he now understood and they could start to mend their relationship. As she looked up she saw that her brother had stopped trembling but was still holding his head down. She was relieved as he began to speak. I think I know what could help you be better. He slowly walked up to her, she was a bit confused by the being better part as she was already great in her own right, but she'd listen to him if he wanted. Izuku put a hand on her shoulder and squeezed, Izumi let out a surprised hiss of pain at it, alerting her friends that something was wrong. Since when was he so strong? The Bakugus didn't step in as she was panicking, it wasn't like a quirkless could do much damage anyway. The younger Yagi leaned closer to her face and showed a smile that could freeze hell four times over as he spoke in a distorted voice. Why don't you take a swan dive off of the roof of the building and hope you won't be a piece of shit in your next life? The entire room froze as Izuku's cheeks tore and he formed a Cheshire grin from ear to ear, filled with razor-sharp fangs. Though he quickly calmed down enough to stitch his face into a normal one and let Izumi go. 
she fell to the floor in shock, looking at him like she didn't understand how this was happening. How the tables have turned. That was the same face he had made when he told them he wanted to be a quirkless hero, and them immediately turning their backs on him. None of them moved an inch as he walked to the door, not through it though, he still had to put the final nail in the coffin. Turning back towards them he spoke in a nonchalant way. I'll tell you all since you were clearly too dense to notice, I haven't wanted to be a pro hero since I was 12. He saw that Izumi's face had turned into an elated one when she heard that, thinking she succeeded. Good, if she had hope he could crush it. If I had to deal with people like you constantly, I'd go insane and eventually maul one of you. I've lost my whole hero admiration shtick as I had a decade of first-hand experience seeing what heroes like you can do. It just isn't worth it putting myself through that sort of thing. They all flinched at how coldly he said that, it was as if he was talking about the weather. Seeing as they were all thoroughly horrified, he decided to do one last thing before he left. Oh one more thing. The trio all flinched, if the thing he forgot was roughly the same as the previous things. It would really buck them up. Izuku both felt and heard the painful growing of his bones, as his nails grew a foot long each and shifted into black at the tips. He slowly used the hand he had transformed to take off his beanie, showing of his curved horns to his incredibly shocked audience. And to top it off, he sent a message to Ivory to brace herself as let his tail unfurl around his middle and sway behind him. Smiling sweetly at them, he said with an airy voice. I've had a quirk since I was 10, this mission has all been pointless for the past four and a half years. And with that he skipped off, tail wagging behind him and all. Chapter 16. Izuku was giddy. He just told off his bullies and their faces were priceless. Choka looked shocked when she saw him at the school entrance, which wasn't that surprising as she'd never seen his horns or tail before. When she tried to talk to him he snarled at her, damn the consequences he felt amazing. She froze when she heard that disturbing sound, her heart started to beat even quicker than usual, and her face started to heat up more than usual. Though Izuku didn't notice that, he was way too busy thinking about the fact that the trio would currently be rethinking all their life choices. Well, Izumi would, the Bakugus would probably only act like they regretted it for Izumi's sake. He didn't think that the blondes could ever give half a damn about him anymore. But that didn't matter, he'd already given up on them. They would hopefully leave him alone now. Izuku skipped over to the cat cafe he had visited before school, it was called the White Dove for some reason. He was pretty sure cats ate doves, and doves were already white, but the name stuck so eh. Entering the shop, he greeted the shocked barista, Shin, with a joyful expression. People were getting shocked all around him today, guess having quirk mutations all of a sudden when your quirkless surprises people, who would have thought? Nobody was in line so he just walked up to Shin. You look different today. Izuku giggled at the confused expression on his friend's face, he was under the impression that Izuku worked under Jormungandr, so he didn't question all the burns and bruises, but this was a whole different category of. Sorry I hid this from you, it was pretty confidential. He said in an apologetic tone, it wasn't exactly a lie though. The reason he'd thrown all that information at his former friends wasn't out of impulse, well mostly, he didn't plan for it to happen so soon. But he was going to tell them before school ended, so that they'd be able to snitch to his parents, and he'd be able to go to a high school, and not deal with the constant verbal and physical abuse, with his brand new quirk registration. Shin just nodded and prepared the teenager's usual order, knowing better than to ask about what that confidentiality was. Izuku laid down on the spot he normally sat at and pulled out his phone, scrolling through the serpent's nest and sending a few messages. The first text was to his tech team, nicknamed the second Hydra's head. Because someone thought that considering both the Jormungandr and the Hydra are mythical reptiles, they fit quite nicely together. When he'd heard of the name it was already too late to call it something else. So now there are eight teams named the Hydra's heads who serve Jormungandr, a snake from Norse mythology ruled over a monster from Greek mythology. The inaccuracy bothered him, but he let it go. What he asked his tech team to do was to hack into the cameras and monitor the trio he had the misfortune of knowing. He had gotten a message when he came out of the school from the snake with a sensory quirk that while his quirk wasn't reacting as intensely, it was still acting up. Considering Izuku was pretty sure that he was safe, this cafe was basically a bunker with the absurdly reinforced walls and glass, so the only thing he could think of was the trio doing something that would cause major problems for him. When he got the confirmation he wanted from them, message the fourth Hydra's head, his communications team. They were the people who owed him some favors but couldn't pay in money and didn't have any skills that would be useful in the other teams. So he chucked them into the fourth head where they got requests and would forward them to people who were available to help. This head was by far the largest, so he could have them do multiple projects at a time. The current one he was concerned about was the nest branching out. After some careful consideration and preparation, he sent multiple snakes in a boat to McQueen and three others to see if he could help people in America. It took a lot of funds and finding the right snakes to make it work, but if he could help people it was worth it. According to the fourth head, they were an hour away from arriving. 
Shin came up to him and served him his food and tea, he was never really a coffee person. Before he could even finish shooing one of his cookies, his phone pinged. Looking over to his lock screen he saw that the message came from the second head's chat. Quickly shoving the rest of his cookie in his mouth, he opened the link that was sent to him. The screen showed the now quartet walking down a suburban neighborhood, none of them looked well, but Kitsuki was by far the worst with his constant coughing. He didn't care all that much about what happened to them, the second head knew what he found important and what he didn't, so it wasn't anything endangering the nest. And if it didn't harm the community he had built, he genuinely couldn't care less about the four of them. Kitsuki was complaining as usual when both Inko and Toshinori came out from an alley. Dad? What are you doing here? Izumi asked in a tired voice, she sounded like she'd been through a lot today. Neither of her parents noticed that though, so they started their speech. Izumi, it's been about time that we tell you this. We've been holding out on this for way too long, and it's time that you know. And with a poof the two of them turned into their hero costumes, with Toshinori inflating too. Well buck me gently with a chainsaw, wasn't expecting that. Izuku mumbled to himself with wide eyes as he watched the four teenagers frown over the heroes on his phone. He knew that the two of them weren't just business partners, if they couldn't even notice that their child's skin turned gray, how in the hell would they avoid getting scanned? He'd even tasked the second head to find out what was going on with them, but they couldn't break through the firewall. The only thing they could determine was that his parents were loaded. Izuku watched with interest as the conversation continued. Due to your heroic actions in saving Katsuki, we have both decided that you should inherit one for all. Iridian Tornado exclaimed with elaborate hand gestures. All Might quickly filled them in on what one for all was, leaving Izuku in shock. The quirk that can be passed down. This flips everything everyone has ever known about quirks upside down. He listened even closer to hear whatever extra details about the quirk, but was quickly disappointed that All Might didn't go into any more detail. What he did discuss was why Izuku couldn't get the quirk. Because he wasn't heroic enough. He didn't have the drive. And yet he was known by every police officer in Japan for being a vigilante overlord. To say it pissed him off would be an understatement. But then he was quickly reminded why he was watching this in the first place by a snake squirming around his chest. She wouldn't dare. If he couldn't start the conversation first, his parents would get to the wrong conclusions and he wouldn't be able to live out his life peacefully. Izumi spoke up at exactly that time. Izuku has a quirk, son of A. Chapter 17. What? Both his parents said in confusion, thinking they misheard their daughter. She repeated herself with a bit more detail than the first time. He showed us Izuku had horns and a tail, and then his teeth were so sharp, and he acted so different and. Her voice started to crack as she tried to explain, his words still fresh in her mind. Everyone else started to comfort her when she started to sob. Izuku just watched on in silent rage, she was going to throw so many wrenches in his plan that it'd look like a tool shop, and yet the only thing he could do was watch them. When Izumi's crying died down to only a few sniffles, her parents were rightfully concerned at what she was saying. It didn't make any sense to them. But then Viridian Tornado remembered something very important. Some police officers had thought that there were way too many gangs in the area around Eldera, maybe there were drugs there. Was her sweet baby drugged? She turned to her husband so quickly he thought she had gotten whiplash from just that. Izuku had to turn up the volume to the max to hear what they were saying, and damn near burst into laughter when he got the gist of it. They didn't believe her, their golden child, their beautiful and heroic daughter. And even then they didn't believe her. He was definitely going to download this and put it into the chat, who cares that the number one and two heroes' identities are on it. Said heroes then turned to the teenagers who had been standing there, confusedly waiting for the adults to finish talking. All Might was the first one to speak up. Did any of you happen to take a suspicious substance or inhale one today? S you can't expect subtlety from a man whose entire career is made of enormous amounts of property damage and casualties caused by the rampaging villains. For once in her life, Izumi caught on very quickly to what her father meant. We aren't drugged he really does have a quirk we all saw the same thing, so it can't be because of a drug. She yelled and stomped her foot like a toddler throwing a tantrum. Izuku was pretty surprised by this, he knew that his sister was childish and naive, but he didn't know it was this bad. He let out a few muffled giggles at seeing her continue her tantrum, it was a good source of entertainment. Iridian Tornado looked at her with pity and answered in a soft voice. We look into it, okay dear. Let's go home first and eat dinner though, it's getting quite late. Looking out of the window, Izuku could see that the sun was setting already. He'd been here much longer than he intended, he'd barely even touched his food. When he looked back to his phone, his blood relatives and former friends were walking off into the sunset like they were in some TV show. While stretching he called Shin over to ask for a bag, he was going to make a pit stop before returning home, and he'd eat while walking. He said his goodbyes and left the shop with his backpack and bag. At first he wanted to reveal to his family that he had a quirk, but no intention to be a hero, just to spite them. But right now he could drive a wedge between his parents and sister, maybe even buck up Izumi's relationship with her friends. 
it was way better than their momentary shock would be. He had walked so quickly that the normal 15 minutes walk turned into a 10 minute one. The current neighborhood he was in was just above the slums, with a high crime rate and few patrolling heroes, it was the perfect place to hide their home base. For most criminals the thing they would hide there would be weapons, drugs, false documents and other generally illegal things. For him it was snakes. 450 different snakes. He doesn't have a problem, they had all agreed to work with him, and they were necessary for his quirk. Trying to convince himself that this was completely normal and necessary, he opened the door to a seemingly run-down factory. The inside was completely different to the outside though, being completely renovated to have all sorts of nooks and crannies for the snakes to nap in. He sadly couldn't enjoy the tropical temperature here for very long, if he wanted to say he took the scenic route, and that's why he came home late. Walking over to the middle of the room, he let Dandelion, show and the snake with a sensory quirk, slither off of him before he reached the couch that was in the center of the building. Ivory made her way up to his shoulders while she shifted back into her original size, and Shro just slithered on next to him. Could you have two glamour snakes come over here? One short range for my mutations and one long range for about the size of a soccer ball. He asked Ivory telepathically while he picked up a shiny trinket off the table and fidgeted with it. Don't ask, he just likes shiny things, nothing more nothing less. Ivory's confirmation came soon after, and it only took a minute for the two snakes to show up. They both looked similar, probably siblings with how their quirks worked pretty much the same. Both took a lot of concentration and would disillusion the user if used on them. He tried his best to memorize all of the snake's quirks, but there was more details in his notes. Riding on his computer and uploading the pictures was much safer than putting them in the Bacchus blast radius. With a quick nod to them both, he let both the snakes slide up his legs and under his shirt, he'd long gotten used to them shrinking under the effect of Shro's quirk. Izuku smirked to himself as they all got comfortable. He wondered how Izumi's expression would look when no one believed her. Chapter 18 Before Izuku even opened the door he could hear screaming, the argument probably started up again. He braced himself before opening the door, his acting needed to be on point for him to ruin Izumi. The screaming stopped immediately when he opened the door. He called out that he was home before slipping on a happy but nervous expression. When he made it to the living room he saw that everyone was sitting on the couch except a livid Izumi, the only other notable thing would be that they were all staring at him with various expressions of concern, rage, disgust, pity and whatever the hell was on Shoka's face. Surprisingly, Inko was the first to speak. My little Izuku since when was your skin like that you're as pale as a ghost? She spoke with a cracking voice, while the famous Yagi tears started to leak from her eyes. Of all the things she could have said, this was it. Inda disappointing honestly. But he couldn't show that on his face and all, so subtle guilt tripping is all he could do unfortunately. He fidgeted with his own hands as he stuttered out a reply. W well it hurt a bit when I woke up B, but you were at HeroCon I didn't want to spoil your fun, and it stopped hitting you after Effie decided it was finished and that very like it. His forced rambling got cut off by Inko catapulting herself against him and sobbing to her heart content. I'm so sorry I never knew something like that happened, did you do anything reckless next time something like this happens, you have to tell us we don't want you to get hurt. She ignored the fact that she, as his mother, hadn't noticed the change as she rocked him back and forth. After hearing all of that, Toshinori stood up and hugged him as well while he began to speak. I agree with your mother, you're way more sensitive to our surroundings than we are. You need to be more careful. Izumi bit her lip and looked at her friends, all of them were staring at the ground before slowly looking up at her. They collectively nodded, though Shoka seemed to be the only sympathetic one, agreeing that they should probably apologize. Knowing Izuku today was all a spur of a moment kind of thing, which was the same for Katsuki so it worked out. Looking up to Izuku, they were stunned with his expression. He looked repulsed at his own parents touching him. When she saw that, Izumi used her quirk in a rage and ripped him from their parents, just so she could throw him into a well. Her brother had no right to be angry at their parent, they did nothing but love him, and he decided to repay them with disgust. Before she could start scolding him to be more respectful, Toshinori turned into his buffed up form and confronted her. Young lady what do you think you're doing? He pointed a bulky finger at her in indignation, his usual smile not present on his face. Izumi, shocked that her father was hostile to her, answered very quickly in a panic. Didn't you see his face he looked disgusted that's no way to treat either of you for loving him all his life. The rage hadn't worn off in the slightest, you could even say that it had grown into a more vicious fury. She and her father continued to scream at each other while Izuku got up. That definitely didn't go as planned. He knew that Izumi wouldn't be thinking straight when he blatantly showed his disgust for them, but outright throwing him against the wall was bold. And painful. Very, very painful. The screeching from the two others wasn't really helping either, though both of them were insufferable even at a normal volume. Inko was just standing there like a deer in headlights, looking between her injured son and furious daughter, but she wasn't screaming, so he'd take that as a win. 
Izuku slowly got up, holding his head which started bleeding, he'd already decided to buck his sister over, so he'd have to go through with it. He looked over at the two of them, Izumi began to float things around and knock them over, as All Might just kept yelling louder and louder. The others were just standing there in shock, not knowing what to do. Should they side with the number one hero, or their friend? They were all standing there and having a moral dilemma when Izuku stood up. Putting his innocent cinnamon roll mask on, he started to speak in a high-pitched and surprised voice. All Might. He yelled in shock, making all the people turn to look at him. Ashinori shrunk down into his twig mite form and coughed up blood, he hadn't meant to reveal such a thing to his son. The energetic green-haired child's eyes sparkled in fanboy-like glee, which quickly turned into concern and panic when he saw the blood. He ran up to his father to ask him if he was okay and if he needed an ambulance. Both Inko and Tashinori were proud at the kind and gentle boy they raised, even if he was too fragile to be a hero, he would still care for things that were far bigger than himself. I'm fine, my boy, the oldest Yagi managed to reply with a cough. Watching all of this, Izumi started to doubt herself. Was she really intoxicated into hurting her little brother? This couldn't be the boy who had looked at her with such cold eyes and told her to jump off a roof. She continued to doubt herself as the conversation between father and son went on. You were all might that so awesome everyone's always been thinking about what your quirk was but must have that a transforming spectator. His rambling was cut off by his mother chuckling fondly, he blushed in embarrassment at that and quickly tried to explain apologize. But Tashinori beat him to the punch by explaining his fight against all for one and the history behind the ancient quirk. Izuku found it very hard to school his expression into being fascinated by his father's story. He'd already heard it once before, but the thing that almost made him break out into a feral expression was how easy it was to get this information out of him. The man barely knew him and thought that this information couldn't be abused. All he'd need to do was use the recording from the suburban neighborhood and go on an anonymous account in the library, and the number one hero would be done for. When the man finished telling his story for the second time that day, Izuku broke out into even more forced mumbles about the quirk. But he still had to play the hero wannab if he wanted to really make Izumi look like she was untrustworthy to the heroes. I have a question, um see can I be a hero too when I'm quirkless? He made his voice go much quieter at the end to make himself seem more nervous, it had the desired effect by the pitying look on his parents' faces. Odd, he couldn't wait to let them see just how much power he had, but he'd have to wait. As he has been waiting for the past four years. Ashinori shook his head with a sad but determined look on his face. No. I have been injured this badly while well, having one for all already, I cannot imagine what a quirkless would be able to do in such a situation. The oldest Yagi tried to be impartial, he couldn't say that he was scared for his son's well-being, as it could be taken wrongly. Everyone in the room felt their hearts break at the distraught look on the green child's face. They knew that it had to be said, but it still hurt to see such a sweet boy look so sad. Izuku mumbled a quiet confirmation before excusing himself and trying to shuffle to his room. The key word being tried as Izumi ran in front of him and wrapped him in a hug. She couldn't be sure if what happened with the suicide baiting was also a hallucination, so she'd tell him now. I know we've been treating you badly over these years, so I want to say we're sorry, but I hope you know that we did it for your safety. All of the teenagers nodded their heads in determination as the adults looked on, confused at what their daughter said about treating him badly. Izuku hugged her back and she thought that they'd made up. That was until he opened his mouth and spoke in a distorted voice. No one will believe you. She stood there, frozen, as Izuku stopped hugging and gave her a good view of his expression. He smirked at her before morphing it into a more innocent smile and walking away. Izuku grinned and jumped on his bed the moment his door was closed. He grabbed his phone and opened the chat so he could tell them all about his day, knowing that everyone would be talking for a while in the living room. Though he knew that it would be longer than he first expected when he heard Izumi started screaming again. Shipping vote. Author's note. I'm going to put the pairing and what I personally think about them, and everyone can vote while I try get out of my writer's block. At the end I'm putting a suggest poly ships here if you want them, because there are way too many combinations. I'm not writing a harem or romance between Izuku and any of his teachers. Maybe married as Awa Yamada or something like romance between teachers that becomes relevant, so if you want that just leave a comment here. Yuga Aoyama. Sarcastic with zero fashion sense plus dramatic fashionista with a lot of flair. They'd be a fabulous duo with hundreds of different outfits to show their fashionable dominance. Mina Shido. Flirt with affection plus dirty jokes. The two of them will flirt constantly, even more so if it makes their less than heroic classmates uncomfortable. Also pop culture references and song and dance battles. Saiu Asui, BLUNT1+, BLUNT2. Green. Izuku would be incredibly passive-aggressive, and Asui would just back him up with straight facts. Then Ida, rule breaker plus rule follower. Ida would constantly try to rein him in and would never give up trying even if it didn't do anything. Though he'd definitely pretend he didn't see that Izuku tripped Katsuki. 
Achako Yuraka, Cinnamon Roll plus Cinnamon Roll. I feel like she would first be friends with Izumi and her gang, but see that they were assholes and join the Izuku Revenge Band. Same for Ida Ship, just a very wholesome and chaotic duo. Ashiro Ajiro, Whip Snake plus Oblivious Furless Squirrel. Sparring Partners. I feel like Izuku would just be a total simp every time Ajiro beats him, and Ajiro would just be incredibly concerned on why he's enjoying being in a headlock. Enki Kaminari, Pre Quirk Movies References plus Pro Quirk Movie References. So much chaos. The two of them would make it their life goal the annoy the absolute living shit out of the Bakugas. Kaminari is a former Bakus Squid member. Ajiro Kirishima, Dark Sunshine plus Bright Sunshine. The Red Sunshine is going to bring out his boyfriend Sunshine, and the Izumi gang is going to get whiplash from how quickly his personality can do a 180 when talking to them. Hoji Kota, Maleficent plus No White. Classic introvert x extrovert. The snakes would either love or hate Rock Boy and have to face Izuku's wrath if it's the latter. Akito Sado, Confident Short plus Shy Giant. The two would have baking battles where nobody could decide who won, the Izumi gang never gets to participate, and they'll all get whiny. Izuku just tells them to buck off and bake their own shit because it would never be as good as his boyfriend's. Mizo Shoji, Quiet Extrovert plus Quiet Introvert. The two of them would like to enjoy their silence and interesting books in peace, the rest of you can kindly piss off. Hayokajiro, Just starting to listen to different music genres plus heavy metal all the way. The two would definitely have secret little rock concert when Izuku learned to play an instrument and they'd just vibe. Antasiro, Poison Ivy plus Spider-Man. Constant puns, yelling, pranks and all-around hyperactive things. No one will ever be at ease with these two around. Yumikage Tokoyami, Sunshine Edgelord plus Dark Edgelord. It's more like a poly relationship between them and Dark Shadow, if you don't agree you fight me with my noodle arms. Like 90% of the time they'd be sarcastic edgelords and then they'd either act like a cute bird or the embodiment of sunshine and confuse everyone except their close friends. Shoto Todoroki, Blurred Blunt plus Oblivious Blunt. Classic enemies to lovers. At first Shoto would side with his sister, but later he'd see just how similar Izuku and Tuya are and try to convince Shoka that what she was doing wasn't right. Then the sports festival happens, Izuku agrees to help Shoto end his sperm donor's career, and our half and half boy would feel like he made a deal with the devil. Hor Hagakur, villainous spy spy plus heroic spy spy. Bonding over the trauma of never being noticed and or being ignored. Once again, way too much energy for two people, more like two dozen. Momoyeoi Rozu, confident genius plus shy genius. You bet your ass that Izuku's gonna help her with her self-confidence, then world domination will be within their grasp. They'd praise her like the queen she is, and their friends would be like their little entourage for some extra flair. Itashi Shinsu, energetic insomniac plus tired insomniac. These two little shits would buck with everyone constantly. Also bonding about cats, trauma and discrimination. Nido Monoma, sarcastic drama king plus prideful drama king. O1A is going to have one hell of a time if these two become a thing. Constantly insulting each other, but if someone else insult their partner, they're going to be traumatized and insecure when the couple are done with them. Itsuki Bakugu, the only way I can image this working is that it's one-sided between Blondie and Jormungandr. If this is what you all want, then I'll figure out whether those feelings would stay when he finds out that Deku is the one he's in love with, or he'll just spend the rest of the series in denial. Maybe Andir? Katsumi Bakugu, it's the same as for Katsuki's, but she'd be way more creepy and obsessive about it. Shoka Todoroki, 100% Yandi Ran won't buck off even when he's dating someone else. I'm pretty sure I'll write this regardless of what the votes are. Izumi Yagi, no. Just no. I am not ready to make any of my fix go that dark. Or Izuku just stays single. Mineta Minoru doesn't exist. You got any ideas for poly ships, you put them here. Chapter 19. Izuku really enjoyed the months after showing off his quirk. His parents didn't believe Izumi and her friends weren't willing to go against the number one and two heroes by agreeing with their daughter. They even made her go see a therapist. Why not a doctor was beyond him, but it did give him a good laugh. In fact, he was so happy making his former friends and family suffer that time flew by. Not to mention that the teachers and students didn't bother him anymore. Although he did get dozens of confused looks at where the buck his mutations came from all of a sudden. Some people even tried approaching him, but quickly backed off when he sent them a glare and hissed. Though thankfully, there weren't that many people trying to talk to him as they were more focused on which career path they were going to take. He was still planning on going to UA, even when he didn't want to be a hero anymore, and surprisingly, the reason for him doing so wasn't solely to spite dumb, dumb and dumber, because even when UA was most known for their hero courses, their other courses were still some of the best in Japan. Even if they were damn near criminally underrated. His first pick was the business course because he already ran a vigilante network, he may as well learn how to improve it. Though he didn't really know what there would be to improve, considering his snakes were the only ones recruiting. But he thought that UA would give him a good overview of what he was lacking. 
So he spent the next six months studying how to hold presentations, convince people, read expressions and how to intimidate others. Okay so at the end it was leaning into manipulation more than bargaining, but people would not see the difference. Probably. He was currently reading a post on Reddit about why psychological warfare was very common in business, and the lady had some good points. Though before he could finish it, his phone pinged. Half closing his laptop and grabbing his phone, being careful not to disturb Titan snuggled up next to him, starting to read the message he had just gotten. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary, just an update on how the Nest's expansion in America was going. Most of it was just when the next ship would arrive in Japan, because he couldn't let snakes use his power source if they hadn't made physical contact, and roughly what types of people joined. He was half looking over the spreadsheet and half listening in on an argument between Genist, McQueen and Dekif, on which hero was the most attention-seeking. Izuku smiled to himself as Elsa joined in with a hero from the Netherlands called Vurjici. But unfortunately for him, something had to ruin his good mood. That something being Izumi and Shoka walking into the White Dove and making a beeline towards him. Shin, who had been reading one of his favorite novels, noticed them and quickly pushed a button under the counter that would make a red light go on under all the tables that had people from the nest at them. Each table had one just in case someone who was deemed dangerous by any person working for Jormungan showed up. Izuku was running this thing for a good five years now, considering that this place was one of the earliest safe houses he made sure it was decked out. As the two girls approached, his smile disappeared from his face and was replaced by an annoyed expression. Shoka was the one who spoke first, surprisingly, he'd always viewed her as a quiet doormat. Hey Izukun. Can we speak to you in private? Izuku visibly grimaced at the nickname, no one had called him that in years, and he'd like to keep it that way. Brings up too many sour memories. After a tense few seconds he finally answered. No, and immediately turned back to his phone, but unfortunately, before he could out his earbuds back and Shoka started talking again. But why we just want to talk to you there's no need to be rude. More like screeching, her annoying high-pitched voice grated painfully against his and Titan's ears, waking the cat up with an angry meow. He didn't even have time to respond to the ice cube before his sister backed her friend up with even more yelling. You have no right to say no to her she's only been kind to you this entire time, so you don't get to treat her like that. Izumi ended her screaming bout with a pout, probably expecting him to sigh and give in. She apparently hadn't gotten the hint when he told her to go on alive herself, or maybe their parents and therapist had convinced her she was seeing stuff. He needed to nip that in the bud. As willing as he was to stretch things out and alter his plans just to screw his abusers over, he had far too much self-worth to put up with someone screaming in his face. Sighing, he closed his laptop completely and turned off his phone, knowing that the two girls were nosy beyond belief. Looking back at them he morphed his slightly annoying expression to one that was pretty damn angry. The two girls flinched, they had seen him get frustrated for a few seconds before schooling his face back into a neutral expression before, but they'd never seen him outright angry. I said no. I have every right to refuse talking to either of you. All you're doing now is causing a scene. Shoka wanted to say something, but quickly cut herself off when she finally noticed the dozens of eyes on them. From an outsider's perspective it'd look she was harassing some poor guy. She'd always had problems with public speaking, and now that she knew for certain that the people around her were judging her, she couldn't utter a single word. Izumi didn't have that problem, neither did she notice all the stares they were getting. She pointed an accusatory finger at him and yelled again. You're the one causing the scene if you weren't so stuck up we could have walked out of here and had a civil conversation, but no you just had to make yourself the center of attention. Her quirk activated unconsciously and small objects were being knocked over. Titan started hissing at her, but she paid him no mind. Izuku could see from the corner of his eye that Shin had gotten up and was making his way to the table, but didn't stop him. After taking a deep breath Izumi started berating him again, not noticing that her little brother wasn't even listening. You've always been like this people won't just bend over backwards for you just because you're quirkless doing this is so stupid fa. She was cut off by a hand being placed on her shoulder. Don't touch me. Izumi snapped back at the person who grabbed her, not even bothering to look and see who it is before shoving the hand away. Before she could continue to spew more bullshit Shin addressed her coldly. Miss, I'm going to ask you to quiet down and perhaps take this outside. When both the girls looked at him, Izuku sent him a look. The quick glance sent towards him was enough to ease his nerves. It was great to have people who could both read him and were on his side. Izumi was still incredibly angry, so she probably didn't notice that Shin was wearing the White Dove's uniform before she began to scream at him. Don't talk to me like that this is something between the two of us and has nothing to do with you. Shoka uttered a small three of us with tears in her eyes, but nobody paid attention to her. Izuku sent a cocky smile to Shin, knowing that he'd know what it meant. Seeing that he needed to remove her from the premises, Shin put on his customer service smile as he spoke to Izumi. Miss, well I see that you and him are in quite the argument. 
You are disturbing the other customers and from what I've heard, this gentleman does not want to talk to you. He spoke to the teenage girl in a cold tone, showing that she was not welcome here. But Izumi, with her lack of common sense and decency, couldn't take the hint. At me your manager I'm a future hero and won't be treated like this. Izumi had tears in her eyes at this point and Shoka tried to comfort her, throwing a glare towards Shin at the same time. Most of the other customers were from the nest, but there were others present that felt incredibly awkward being there. They quickly ate and drank, hoping that the situation would calm down. Izuku was enjoying the show on front of him, he even grabbed his phone and startled filming after Shin stepped in. What are you waiting for? Izumi yelled, her voice cracking into sobs halfway through. Shin still held that iconic customer service smile when he answered her. While well, I could call the manager here I don't think he would be able to do anything to me, considering I'm the owner. The two girls froze in shock when hearing that while Izuku tried his darndest to keep from laughing. Though it was incredibly hard as Izumi looked like a deer in headlights. Shin continued after a few seconds of tense silence. I believe you've disturbed my customers enough for one day, and I kindly ask you to leave before I call security. Shin's voice was a lot more firm when he dropped his customer service persona. Izumi was only shook out of her stupor when Shoka quite literally shook her, finally noticing that they'd made the entire store uncomfortable. Though the two of them didn't make any move to leave the cafe. Shin massaged his head and sighed. Fine then. Sakuri. Crack. Everyone stared in horror as Shin fell to the ground after being hit in the head by a flying base. You could nearly hear a pin drop. Until Shin groaned from the ground and all hell broke loose. Customers were screaming, people were calling ambulances, cats were meowing wildly as they were nearly trampled, and others were frozen in shock. Both of the girls were frozen not believing what just happened. They didn't even notice that Izuku had immediately ran to Shin's side, accidentally shoving Titan, and tried applying his mediocre first aid skills. He easily turned the adult over to see how bad it was. Though he, unfortunately, couldn't see all that much through Shin's dark blue hair. But he could smell the blood on him. Just like those tired crimson eyes with that same fluid running down his face, looking like he'd already accepted that he wouldn't make it out from under the rubble. Izuku quickly shook his head and tried to calm down, he hadn't brought ivory with him today, and the snakes he had on him weren't very helpful for first aid. First, he needed to know if there was a skull fracture or not, turning around to ask Izumi just how hard she had thrown that base, he found that she was gone. She ran like a coward. Just like the other heroes, leaving one of their own crushed under the rubble, but would still be able to save if they hadn't turned tail at the first sight of danger. He didn't have a sterilized cloth on him, but there should a first aid kit somewhere behind the desk. After carefully laying Shin down and watching as the last of the customers left the shop and waited outside, he jumped over the counter and looked around. He didn't bother picking up the things his tail had knocked over while thrashing wildly. There weren't any visible weapons around like guns, those were very far in the back room, but no med kit either. He ran to the employee's only door and threw it off its hinges, leaving a handprint where he grabbed it. Seeing that there was a med kit there he grabbed it and was back at his friend's side within the blink of an eye. Izuku hastily opened it as Shin closed his eyes and groaned once more. Best stay awake alright. The green child's voice was squeaky and anxious as he tried to help any way he could. Thankfully, Shin opened his eyes again, though barely and he looked completely out of it. Izuku's hands were shaking as he ripped open the kit and grabbed some bandages and disinfectant to treat the wound. He shakily moved some of his friends. Long black hair, tangled over and under concrete and other construction materials he couldn't put a name to. Mid-length dark blue hair out of the way and applied the bandage. Shin whimpered just like the man who would probably be scarred for life after this, both physically and mentally. The puppy that was abandoned. Izuku didn't apply any pressure to the wound, afraid that there was a fracture and he'd break the skull. His eyes were hazy through the tears and he started to cough as the smoke spread through the building, but he had to keep moving. If not for himself then for one of the few heroes he admired that was resting on his back, nearly unconscious but not quite. Izuku didn't register when the paramedics came, he barely even remembered them having to drag him away from his injured friend. Some part of him was hoping that the snakes on him were smart enough to hide his mutations from everyone. But he didn't feel anything towards that thought. He just. He just felt like everything was crashing down. Chapter 20. She Fractured Shin's Skull. Luckily there wouldn't be any permanent damage other than a scar, though he would have to stay in the hospital for about three weeks. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was that Izumi had the gall to do something like that in broad daylight. And normally, she'd get away with it too because it would ruin her career in heroics if it was on her record. But normally there wasn't the most wanted vigilante in Japan witnessing what she'd done and be willing to tear her apart. Unfortunately not physically, but mentally is still on the table. Well, more than he was already doing. He was already rigging the local news articles to write about how a promising young hero could do such a thing. Though he did change the ones that called her a villain, the whole black and white hero worship went against everything he stood for. 
but the ones that he had confronted tried twice as hard to put her in a bad light so they could get back on his good side, so that was something at least. Her parents scolded her, but still wanted her to be a hero, so they tried to stop the media. That was quickly put to an end when Shin told his green-haired best friend that he'd like to sue her, but didn't think that he knew how. When Izuku said he'd help him, Shin was skeptical. Skepticism then turned into shock as Izuku sent him a friend request through his Jormungandr account instead of his Moskai account. Safe to say that it was too late for All Might and Viridian Tornado to save their daughter's reputation when the nest didn't bother to hide the fact that they were getting involved with the case. And when the second Hydra's head doesn't bother with discretion, they could put Endeavor's HR team to shame. If you consider just how many lawsuits get flung at that man on a daily basis, you can get a feel of how impressive that was. Though it did bring them much more attention from the police and heroes who probably thought they were going to make a move. But they'd be fine as long as there wasn't enough evidence for a search warrant. Izuku should probably try and figure out how to make it harder to get into the server if the phone you're using has permission. Right now the only thing that stopped the police from wiping all of them out was the fact that you could only get in through a code that one of his snakes had given you, it only worked once, and if you lost your device, you would need to go to a location at a specific time and request a new code. Of course, the places were randomly selected and there would only be people there around said designated time. If anyone took longer than a month to show up, they're locked out of the nest. One snake or person messes up, the authorities would have access to the nest Izuku worked so hard to create. But he could always ask a teacher how that stuff works and say that he wanted to do a fun project about making the most secure website he could. There was only one teeny tiny problem with his plan. Just one. Nedzu. You know, the smartest being in Japan who also happens to be the principal. Not that he would be all that much of a problem, he barely paid any attention to kids from other courses from what Izuku could scourge up. There were plenty of UA dropouts and he wasn't sure whether he was surprised or not. Some people even said there was a teacher who expelled entire classes at once, but were too scared to give a name. Only a description of a scraggly and relatively tall man in his late twenties to early thirties with long black hair and glowing red eyes. A hero with an obvious mental quirk impaled and crushed. There was so much blood and everyone was just running away and Izuku shook his head to get out of that daze. He refused to think about the last time he'd gone out as Jormungandr, it was where the police got his physical description and where his reputation skyrocketed. Luckily he was in his assault form so there was no chance for them to recognize him on the street, but he wouldn't risk it. It didn't matter if it was illogical or not, Izuku was terrified of being found out and subsequently putting all of the people in his nest in danger. He shook his again, this time also slapping his cheeks for good measure. Izuku didn't have the luxury to think about this stuff when he was about to take his exam. He had gotten to UA a good hour and a half early to avoid Izumi and her gang. That reminded him, didn't Shoka's brother take the recommendation exam? He'd heard about it during one of their many sleepovers, along with the quirk marriage thing, which nearly made him forget all of the hours of sleep he'd lost because of the girls and Katsuki's yelling. Nearly. Walking through the gates he thanked his luck as the alarm didn't go off, he wanted to both be himself and fade into the background, and setting off the security alarm on the exam day wouldn't help the latter. But while he didn't sound the alarm, he still couldn't get into the building as the doors were locked. Deciding that he'd just wait until someone opened the door, he went into the chat. Not the nest, the one where all of his friends were. Izuku didn't want to risk being found out, the stout could probably make out what he was doing on Izuku's phone as Moskai. Though he only needed a login for the chat so he was still Cinnamon Roll. This house is on fire, Cinnamon Roll, got here way too early, the school's still closed. Coconuts bitch, oh traumatized them so badly that those hero bastards want to go buck off into their shitty retirement, Fron, keep swearing to a minimum bud, I woke up like 5 minutes ago. Best genist Kinney, there's no need to worry after a single glance at you those Judes won't be able to reject your magnificence. Bragram, Judges, Hobbit, just where in the hell do you get the motivation to keep doing this shit? Lightning Queen, Emma needs some of that too for MT homework. Bragram, first of all, Ekephisa Disgris, sometimes I wonder just why I'm still here. Bragram, Emma I'm going to, some some, Mountain Mai, second of all, I have a feeling you're doing this just to spite me. Skyrim dude, I think what we're all trying to say is good luck, Hobbit, only you, Coco and Genist. Leave the rest of us out of this mess. The Scrimsabitch. I'd like to wish him luck too. Hobbit. Well you weren't fast enough to be included. Cinnamon Roll. Only four out of you all. I'm offended. Ekephisa Disgris. When aren't you? Fron. DBH you are a bit of a drama king. S. Genist Kinney. Excuse me. Lightning Queen. You, my friend, are the drama emperor. No mere king can stand against you. S. Genist Kinney. I'm glad that you see the truth, favorite peasant. Hobbit. We get it McQueen, you're a simp. Fron. Ooh what's the ship name? Lightning Queen, I'm not a simp, coconuts bitch, then what the buck are you? Cinnamon Roll, a donkey, hobbit, an animated race car. Lightning Queen, a favorite peasant, a scrimps a bitch, currently you are. 
Fron, better watch out before someone steals that title. Cinnamon Roll, I'll fight you for it, Ekephisa Disgris, that looks terrifying. Raygram, fight, Hobbit, and this is when I go back to the depressing real world. Discount Elsa, out it can be worse than this. Skyrim dude, since when were you here? Discount Elsa, since the beginning of time, I crawled out of the darkness only now to cause chaos. Cinnamon Roll, Edgelord, Hobbit, Edgelord, Fron, Edgelord, Lightning Queen, Edgelord, S. Genus Kinney, Edgelord. Discount Elsa, I can accept everyone else doing this, but Sin is just as much, if not more, of an Edgelord than I am. Izuku could only write half of his reply before someone approached him. Whipping his head around he saw the voice hero, present Mick. His quirk allowed him to amplify his voice giving him an ability that is similar to a sonic scream. The sound of his screams is loud enough that it has been reported to make people ears bleed from a distance. One of his most common weaknesses is that his screams do not travel well underground, making his quirk ineffective against anything that is underground or separated by a layer of earth. Hey little listener just wanted to let you know that the exam starts in a little more than an hour, so while well you came here pretty dang early, we can't officially let you in, you dig. The blonde man gave him the awkward finger guns at the end. Izuku really didn't want to stay outside and didn't want to guilt trip one of his teachers, fade into the background after all, so he just replied in a nonchalant way. It's fine, I came this early on purpose to avoid people. Would you mind calling me over when you can let me in? There was an awkward silence for a few seconds before the hero responded. Sure little listener I'll talk to Nedzu and see if I can let you in early, so see you in a bit. Even more finger guns later and Izuku was alone again. He spent the few minutes waiting for present Mick to think about his quirk, because he could rarely go wrong with that. So with his quirk there have to be mutations with it, like his hearing is better protected so he won't go deaf, or his focal cords have been modified, so he could use his quirk more efficiently. But that also brings up the theory that he could use his voice at different frequencies, which is a whole other can of worms. If he really could use his quirk at different frequencies, would he be able to make his allies hear a specific message through the comms and an unidentifiable sound to others? Though that'd be pretty bad for publicity. Izuku could hear a person coming near him again, but kept mumbling for a while before they were about six feet away from him. He turned around to see present Mick, looking pretty surprised that he'd noticed him. While little listener got some good observational skills there, the hero replied in a chipper tone, Izuku was pretty surprised that it didn't sound fake. So that's either his actual personality or he'd gotten really good at acting. Thanks my quirk makes my senses pretty sharp, but I've gotten good at noticing people, so my classmates can't surprise me anymore. He physically couldn't call them his friends without resisting the urge to gag, and he was glad that he didn't call them that. Even if his acting was good in his opinion, present Mick slightly twit he'd at the wording. Yes he must know about the discrimination against physical mutations that aren't pleasing to the eyes. Wrong kind of discrimination but at least he wasn't too dense. Like Izumi's parents. That's really impressive little guy I can't wait to see what you can do at the exams with that, I'm sure you'll impress the judges. Present Mick kept on being all happy and jolly, but Izuku could tell that there was a twinge of concern behind all of that. Now the question was. Does he want the heroes to investigate his family and previous school? It's not like he'd use the nest to do it, that would be way too suspicious. Just follow me. Izuku followed the blonde hero into a giant auditorium that held way more people than he thought would apply to the business course. Not that he thought about it, he didn't actually tell present Mick which course he was going to try for. The hero turned to him and placed both his hands on his hips while speaking. Just take a random seat and I'll bring you the leaflet of the heroics entrance exam. Ah, that explains it. Izuku gave him about the most unimpressed expression he could muster as he spoke to the man in a stern voice. Sir, I get that I didn't tell you which course I was trying for, but I'm going to be trying for the business course. I have no intention of being a pro hero. Present Mick seemed to be caught off guard, but his face quickly turned into a guilty expression. He waved his arms around while apologizing in a loud tone, probably activation his quirk subconsciously. I'm so sorry little listener I didn't mean to assume that Vlad just said that you were probably one of the kids who would try and get an early start, and I just went with it damn, I feel really bad now. The normally energetic hero scratched his head and quickly led me to the business entrance exam without a shortage of apologies. Izuku was glad that it really seemed to be an accident, but hoped that not everyone would be like that. Chapter 21 The written test for the business course was pretty simple, it was basically the same as for the general education course, but the essay questions at the back were changed, so they'd be more about general knowledge on how things ran in a business and all that. Izuku didn't know if the test was just easy or if he was way too prepared for it. What bothered him wasn't the feeling of anxiety bugging him about if he really passed the test or if he was just imagining it. No, it was the second part of the test that made him completely forget about his worries. They'd be watching the potential hero students and think about the best ways to market them, then hold a presentation about that. 
the way is a hero school and all, but there were plenty of other professions that had barely anything to do with the heroics industry. The presentation part made sense, but it being basically a live analysis rubbed him the wrong way. And by the looks of about a third of the examinees, he wasn't the only one who thought so. Izuku had a quirk now so he wouldn't just get ignored if he asked about it, as depressing as that sounded, and he really wanted to know. But in the end he decided to keep his mouth shut, there was still discrimination against mutant quirks, and as much as he hoped that UA was different, he didn't want to risk it. So he stayed silent as everyone was separated into groups and given tablets. Unfortunately he had to give good advice for Izumi, but seeing that she looked tired and snappy made up for it. She must be so stressed with the media and the lawsuit hounding her. He even overheard from Tashinori that one for all wasn't working anymore. Sucks to be her. But the import thing was the sheer variety of quirks in the exam. Izuku knew that there'd be all sorts of quirks at a heroics entrance exam, but it was still a sight to see. There was a blonde who seemed to keep switching between quirks, from watching him Izuku thought that it was a copy quirk most likely. The quirk could probably only last a few minutes, but it wasn't very clear from the video footage. It was such an incredible quirk though Izuku wanted to know if there was a limit to how many quirks the blonde could store, he knew there had to be a limit when he took his own quirk into account. But he'd need to theorize about that later, he couldn't just put all his focus into one examinee after all. There was a redeed with a quirk that made his skin turn into something akin to stone, though it looked like he couldn't move while his quirk was active. It seemed like a simple quirk at the surface, but there were still many questions like, did his skin regenerate while in that state? Did the toughness of his skin depend on muscle density? Were those shark teeth of his a part of his quirk? Did his quirk rely on a time limit or his stamina? Probably the latter actually. The next examinee was a boy with purple hair that defied gravity and eye bags that seemed to carry the weight of his sorrowful existence. When Izuku saw him, he thought that the boy had a strong emitter type quirk, considering how lanky he looked. But he just grabbed a pipe and tried to attack a robot, but chickened out halfway, though he did manage stab a pole through one of the eyes eventually and killed it, so kudos to him. From that performance, Izuku guessed a mental quirk or something of the sort. Although it was pretty disappointing that the guy thought Yue wouldn't do this type of thing. It may be a hero school, but clearly it isn't what the media made it out to be. But anyway. He could think about how disastrous the school year was going to be, and when to transfer later, right now there were too many quirks to analyze and too little time, and also think of how to advertise them, that was what he was supposed to do for this exam after all. Looking back to the screen he could see Izumi yelling at some guy who looked like he had some rock mutation, poor kid was on the brink of tears. Not all that heroic, Izumi. Totally not cool. The next person Izuku set his sights on was a girl with brown hair who, at first, looked like she had some sort of telepathy. But she couldn't move the objects afterwards, she had to push them to move them, and then clap her hands to let them out of her control. That wouldn't classify as telekinesis or telepathy. Maybe something like float. Or something to do with gravity. Like lessening the gravity of an object when touched with five fingers. And doesn't that just open a whole other can of worms with questions like, can she manipulate the amount of gravity she removes? Does the reduction of gravity vary if the objects are different sizes? Is a heavier more tiring or a larger one? Izuku quickly noted everything down on a Word document before continuing to watch her, she had the strangest quirk he has seen in a while. He sipped on his water when turning back to the live feed and did a spit take. Not only was the gravity float girl stuck underneath a pile of rubble, it turns out that the zero pointer was a fair bit larger than a bucking skyscraper. Everyone was fleeing from the robotic monstrosity, while the brown haired girl struggled to get out from underneath the concrete, looking like she had quirk exhaustion, preventing her from using the most obvious illusion. Izuku was a bit on edge, considering that what he had seen from UA wasn't all the impressive, but there had to be some kind of emergency break for the robot. While he was speedily checking all the cameras he found a green blur among the crowd, running towards the giant robot instead of away from it. His eyes dilated, trying to discern exactly who was trying to help the girl. What would have been admiration quickly turned into annoyance when he saw that it was Izumi using her quirk to propel herself. He'll give it to her, though begrudgingly, helping the girl was a good thing to do. Izumi slowed to a stop in front of the girl, and instead of asking her if she was okay, peered at the giant robot. She only seemed to notice the injured girl when said girl let out a pained whimper and tried to speak to her. Unfortunately the feed didn't have any audio, nor was the camera close enough for him to lip read. The screen shook as the zero pointer moved onward, it was now only one step away from crushing the girl. Izuku thought that his retarded sister would use her telekinesis, but he was once again proved wrong. She somehow activated one for all, which shouldn't have been working at the time from what he gathered, and then proceeded to yell smash as hard as she could while punching the robot. Doing so, she managed to break both the leg she jumped with and the arm she punched with. Maybe that's what Tashinori meant by one for all not working, maybe it broke her body when she used it. 
he quickly shoved aside the thought that using her telepathy would have been much more efficient, he spent his entire life with her, so he damn well knew that it wasn't a lack of stamina as she plummeted to the ground. Izuku suppressed a laugh as the float gravity girl slapped his sister to save her, which was almost as hilarious as the look of pure astonishment and confusion on Izumi's face. He watched his sister scream at the girl, who was still stuck under the rubble, for a few seconds before present Mick announced that the entrance exam was over. The brown-haired girl looked hurt as Izumi used her quirk to float off, looking to be on the brink of passing out, still not helping her out from under the rubble. Like really. He couldn't even justify this behavior as her being stressed about the lawsuit. Izuku sighed as he tore his eyes from the footage and leaned back into his chair. It shouldn't be too hard for him to compose a presentation in the two hours that were left. Picking up his notes, he read over all the examinees he had managed to get a semi-detailed analysis on. His first pick was the redeed, but that was too easy and probably wouldn't get him into the business course. Float Gravity Girl's quirk had too many questions about just what it was, and the same was said for the eternally tired purple-headed teen. So his obvious pick was the blonde. Fishing out his laptop, he opened a Word document and started to first copy all his notes over and then start refining them. When he only had five minutes left someone came into the room and Izuku planned to just shoot whoever it was a quick glance, and that was it. But that didn't happen. Looking up from his computer he saw a grey scarf and long black hair. The underground hero was stuck there and no one was trying to save him, all his colleagues were just running away. Izuku sat like a deer in headlights, staring at the man as his breathing quickened. There was just so much blood and his base instincts told him that the man didn't have much time. Noticing someone staring at him, the sleep-deprived hero looked over his shoulder as the teacher who had been watching over them, read over whatever was brought. Izuku needed to do something, it didn't matter how much smoke he himself inhaled or if he may end up with bullet wounds at the end of the night. Crimson eyes locked with toxic green ones, widening in recognition as the most wanted vigilante in Japan ran to the hero, steps thundering as reptilian legs stomped on the ground with a force that damaged the floor. Neither of them said anything, because there was no time for any of that, Jormungandr hefted the construction materials off of the man and placed them elsewhere. He could now clearly see the damage done to the hero, the worst damage was at. The shoulders of the hero looked uneven as far as Izuku could see, he needed to look anywhere else instead of those eyes that looked so much like. Blood rushed out of the man's injuries even quicker, as the vigilante hoisted the hero on his back. Izuku violently flinched as the announcement came on that the tests had ended and that the business course needed to go to another room. But he didn't catch which room because the hero, Ira, hey eraser head, the giant spoke to the trembling man as he moved both of them through the building, as fast as his large frame would allow. His mind was too fueled with panic to be able to call on one of his snake's quirks, god forbid one that would actually be useful. Izuku stayed as still as a statue as the hero moved towards him. He couldn't be caught now. Don't die on me just yet, he had too many people he cared about still left. Wouldn't want to see your boyfriend no, fiancé, to plan your funeral instead of your wedding, right? And so he did the only thing he could do. He ran. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day. Bye.